So picking up from where we left off, uh, I'll just read the previous paragraph. And thus it was nearly sunset and the master was seated amongst some disciples near the very crypt of a room in which his holiness had confined himself last year, that a boy suddenly crept in unannounced and before anyone could even recognize him had fixed a wreath of roses on the golden ringlets of his, of his holiness. I for one could not place the haggard and hollowed eyed face in my memory at the moment until I was actually told that it was Master Ahmed. Ernie, could you unmute and uh, read chapter from chapter 23, please? Ernie's connecting to audio. So I'll, I'll read until he's ready. Messengers of Love is the title of the chapter. With the reestablishment at its original site, once again, all began to go on well with the Mayor Ashra. But be it said to the credit of the Maribad authorities that in spite of such a drastic change from one place to another, the school remained closed only for a single week. Although on account of the change brought in the curriculum, it no longer remained a high school, yet the Hazrat Babajan English School could boast now of a debating club, which enabled many of its little members to give expression to their thoughts, though not quite in correct English unflinchingly for their teachers and fellow students. Ernie, available now? Oh, I guess his, his audio is not connecting. The master also resumed taking interest in all affairs as usual and brought his retreat to an end. He began moving about freely all over the colony and through his usual gestures spoke with the disciples and visitors whenever they approached him. The boys of the original section also got the pleasure and benefit of his august presence among, amongst them every evening. Yet for all that, His Holiness continued paying the lion's share of his attention to the Prem Ashram inmates. The most remarkable point about the masters working for the Prem Ashram boys during this period of one month was that His Holiness began to cleanse their latrines from the 17th of December. The only person that His Holiness allowed to assist him in this task was his younger brother, Mr. Jal Shariar who is not only one of the chief supervisors of the Prem Ashram, but also as keen about and interested in it as to be next to the master. Thus, to the future saints in the Prem Ashram who were taught humility in words, this so-called menial but by no means pleasant work of a sweeper that the master did also taught humility and deeds besides serving whatever other spiritual purpose his holiness might have had in view. It might be added that such kind of work 
on the part of a God-realized personality is rare, but not unparalleled. And to give a recent example, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa is also said to have worked as a sweeper. Uh, Marvin, are you ready to continue? Unmute and... Uh, All right. From here. The reader <clears throat> might have marked the peculiar peculiarity that since its inception, the institution went through a complete new phase almost every month or 40 days. Hence, when the master began to let out hints at the beginning of the new year, 1929, about going on a walking tour and closing the Meher Ashram completely, but temporarily for some time, it did not seem so very strange to most of the disciples. Yet it can fairly be said that none were prepared to see the hints turned into actions so soon as the 12th of January. Not only did the master announce his final decision to act upon his hints, but actual preparations were completed the same day to send away all the boys of both the sections of the ashram, including those who had come from Persia, to their guardians' place, places on the following day. Being in possession of all the facts about the institution in their correct sequence, I was naturally very much puzzled about the question of Ali, that after all the trouble, when his father had at last allowed Ali to remain in the ashram and given a fresh promise not to disturb him again, he should be sent back to his father's place, it appeared to me quite unthinkable. Hence, my surprise may well be imagined when I went up to the ashram the following morning, the morning of the fateful 13th of January, it was the master himself who conveyed to me Agha Ali's father has again taken him away only a little while ago. You can see now that the closing of the ashram has some connection with Ali. The first thought that crossed my mind was to remember the ringing words of the master. These moguls are word breakers and not to be trusted. What better example could one cite as to how irreligion is practiced by many in the name of religion? Some of the orthodox moguls think it irreligious to allow their little ones to enjoy the grace of a God-realized personality who is above all religions. But alas, they conveniently forget the injunction of the Holy Quran. Quote, the believers are those who are keepers of their covenants and fulfill the promise. Now, in the light of this episode, there was no mystery surrounding the end of the Meher Ashram and its original conception from the viewpoint of this narrative. It rather reminded us of the words of the master conveyed some 11 months ago, which were, if Ali goes, all go. And it really so happened that Ali was really the first to go out of the Meher Ashram on the morning of the 13th January, while all the rest followed him later on the same day. A word as to the sorrow and pain the little but real lovers of the master felt at the thought of separation will not be out of place here. It has truly been said, angels have all, the, all love but no pain. And what is this pain about the divine love that is only destined for the human beings? It is the pain of separation or in other words, the restlessness for union, which even the angels do not possess. It is unbearable and beyond description, yet a loving soul can bear it. Hence, I would only say this much, that some of the boys did feel this pain whilst bidding a touching goodbye to the master that day, but they exhibited sublime submission to his divine command instead of the spirit of reactionary revolt that they used to display in the primal state of their love. 
Some of them were perhaps separated to enhance the stage that no longer needed the physical contact of the master. Some have since been recalled. But all the Meher Ashram boys of both its sections, as a matter of fact, were that day let loose over the country with a silent message of divine love that will sooner or later speak for itself. By way of a farewell meeting, I am sure the reader would like to be introduced to some of the leading messengers of love, besides those already acquainted with him in the course of this narrative. We shall begin with Master Vasant Kimbabni, a Brahmin lad aged 14 years. He was the first boy in the Meher Ashram to begin weeping for love, and the last boy who has remained weeping to this day. Of course, it is thereby never meant that he is weeping all the time throughout the 24 hours. Rather, the moment he comes before the master, tears begin to roll down his cheeks. So silent are the throbs of his heart that not the least sign of a sob is perceptible about him when he cries. It is a wonderful sight to see him crying, standing like a statue without any sign of emotion on his face or a mark of restlessness about his body, he seems to be looking towards the master with dreamy and moist eyes that go on shedding pearls one after the other until the master goes away from him. And this peculiar manifestation of divine love about him is not an occasional affair. It has almost become his second nature. Be he walking, sitting, eating or engaged in any other way, he has only to count his eyes on the master and they begin to fill with tears instantly. It has been said that Ali once cried because others did not obey the master, but Master Vasant surpasses him in this respect as once he was found smacking himself vigorously till he was actually forced to stop it. And the reason for this a self-imposed punishment was that this was that the weeping Vasant could not bear the sight of one of the boys behaving rudely with the master. Of all the things he likes best is to be allowed to remain with his head pressed against the lotus feet of the master for hours together. When once he was asked about the most cherished desire of his heart, this great lover replied, I want nothing, I want to give, and I want to give my life to Baba. When that is done, I shall desire for another life to be laid at his feet again. This is all the more wonderful since he is not of a docile nature. He is as fiery as a tiger. During the period of the ine inevitable reaction, he had once made a grown up overseer in the Prem Ashram, roll in the dust with a single push. He is no less intelligent and has a passion for poetry, which he can remember after hearing but once or twice. Nay, he is a poet himself, and at times he can compose fine lines in the style of Tukaram Baba and Gayaneshwari Maharaj. His profound consideration for the master may well be judged by the fact that once when he got dysentery, he did not disclose the fact in order not to cause any trouble to the master, who he knew too well would personally involve himself in the matter of treatment and nursing. In spite of passing 30 stools, Lassant managed to conceal his malady till his condition was actually detected by one of the overseers. Uh, thank you, Marvin. Uh, er Ernie, could you unmute and continue? <clears throat> his love restlessness, his love, re his love restlessness is matchless. And none of the others can surpass him in this respect. But in spite of having the greatest restlessness in appearance, he looks exceptionally calm and composed. Generally, he looks the very picture of seriousness as he is continuously deeply 
engrossed in meditation about the master. He remained thus even when sent home, where he used to look as if he were almost dumb, since he would generally speak in monosyllables with his parents and relatives. In short, in the words of the master, he is almost a saint already. Master Asvandiyar Saroshirani may well be congratulated on having advanced on the path that directly leads to God realization. Generally, the different religious practices are believed to be paths that lead to the truth. But in fact, these various ways only lead one to the real path, which is the only which is only one and the same, whether it whether it is reached by this or that means. It is only when one reaches this real path that one is supposed to have really taken a birth from the spiritual viewpoint. In the case of this lucky boy, it happened all of a sudden. On New Year Day, 1929, Master Aspandiar became un unconscious. But it was not an ordinary unconsciousness. Since he lost consciousness of the gross plane, he became conscious of the subtle plane. This came to be known generally when shortly the master restored him to gross consciousness to a certain extent. And since then, to quote his own words, he sees unimaginable light, hears wonderful sounds, smells indescribably sweet odor, and experiences different phenomena, including that of floating in space and so on. There are but poor terms to bring within imagination that which is beyond intellect. To give another illustration of his state, when he was asked to describe as to what happened to him when he became unconscious, he replied, Baba broke my skull and the light began to manifest out of it. He did not look in any way concerned when he was told that he was to be sent back to Persia. Not a single tear was found in his eyes when he departed from Meherabad. On the contrary, he looked much amused and smiling while looking here and there through his half-closed eyes. Master Suryabin, belonging to the so-called depressed class, is another lucky lad to have achieved almost permanent concentration on the master. He is neither seen smiling nor weeping, but he is conspicuous for his great silence and indifference towards his, his surroundings. He is the least talkative in the lot and continued to manifest the silent aspect of love even when he was at home, which often provoked the mischievous boys of his village to go to the length of stoning him for the sheer fun of it. Once he actually remained indoors for six days to avoid being disturbed by such mischief makers and other grown-up villagers, including the Patel of the village, for whom naturally enough, the spiritual of the state, the spiritual state of the boy was a sealed book and who also caused no small annoyance to the boy in trying to bring him round to his own vulgar way of thinking. The great control Master Sriabin has achieved over his mind can be easily gauged from the fact that when on the seventh day he came out of the house, he was again stoned, but instead of protesting or retaliating in the least, he calmly withdrew. Silent submission seems to be his watchword. Wonderful, Ernie. Thank you. Um, uh, Marianne, could you continue, please? Unmute first. Then, Datu Mandergi, a Brahmin youngster, provides yet a new phase of the divine feelings. He was the last to leave the ashram at the time of the temporary close-up. 
On coming to know of the separation, he began to weep and wail and continued crying for three successive days without being able to check himself in spite of his best attempts to do so. If you don't return soon, he said to the master amidst soul-stirring sobs, I would start wandering all over the world crying out your name. I don't mind if I am not elevated on the path. Only keep me with you. Formerly, he was very fond of studies and sports, but now he is so very full of feeling for the master that he simply abhors all studies and games. The depth of his feelings may well be imagined from the fact that all thoughts of home and relatives are now foreign to his mind. Master Shahu Mahar and Hormuzd provide the finest pair of mediators in the Meher Ashram. The former once asserted, quote, if there is happiness in the world, it is only found in meditation. And true to his words, when sent home, Master Shahu had set up a little hut for himself in a quiet little corner outside the house, wherein he used to remain absorbed in meditation for nearly 18 hours every day. The name of Ali Akbar, the Majnun of the Meher Ashram, has already been mentioned in previous chapters. The intensity of his love towards the master is unique. None can come to the level of his highly active love, which always keeps him on the stir. He is seldom seen in one place or sitting calmly. When he first joined the Meher Ashram, he used to feel quite disinterested in discussions about love and spirituality. He would not only show open disinclination for divinity, but used to fight shy of all such subjects and would remain as aloof as possible from meditation and concentration. But all the same, at the first exit of Ali, the hero, Ali Akbar became all of a sudden surcharged with the divine grace of the master. He began to roll and reel in the dust, quite literally, as a fish just out of water, till he would come into the master's contact, whom he would try to enfold in his little arms as furiously as a moth tries to devour the lamp. After some months, he became a little cooler, but to this day, he remains as active as a top. Even a stranger would not fail to notice the great twinges on his face and twitches around his limbs when he is in the presence of the master. The moment his holiness shows an inclination to receive him, Ali Akbar literally takes a bound towards the master and begins to fondle with him in a very violent way. It is not enough for him to embrace or kiss the person of the master a number of times, but invariably he would bite and scratch his holiness all over the body. It is always with an effort that the master can free himself from Ali Akbar's hugging caresses. Once he allows this intense lover to clasp him. The violent throbs of his heart are too thrilling to allow master Ali Akbar to meditate. He never meditates and has never meditated. All that he does is hard labor that demands intense activity. He generally passes his time in wrestling with the Mother Earth, with the help of spades and pickaxes in trying to grow flowers, fruits, and vegetables for his Baba. And consequently, 
both at Toka and Arangaon, small patches of shrubberies have come to be a part and parcel of the Meher Ashram. There is yet one more little lover of the master of this violent type, although not so very intense as Ali Akbar. Master Kuda books can be said to be next to Ali Akbar in all the other details of his feelings for his holiness. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Um, Joyce, please. Could you unmute first? Can I interrupt just for a second? Is this Alaba Ali Akbar? Does anybody Got know? me hanging. I think so. I think it is too. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's Alaba. Yeah. And his real name is Ali Akbar Shapur Zaman. Uh -huh. Baba gave him the name Alaba. Thank you, Mahu. So there's probably like a million Ali Akbars in in India and probably another several million in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, where were we? Joyce, please, yes. Quite in contrast to the above two is Master Maruti Kambal. He is almost as, he is almost an automaton. automaton. He carries out the master's instructions with mechanical precision and knows no restlessness, no emotion, save that of enjoying the proximity of his holiness. Master James Titus is another sincere aspirant and one who meditates from the bottom of his heart. His one longing is to see the master internally so that he can always have his holiness before his eyes, even when he is separated. <clears throat> he is so sincere that he has frequently followed the master's instructions to the letter. For instance, once in the course of a lecture, the master conveyed that they all should know themselves to be quote unquote spirits and should forget that they were quote unquote bodies. And the next day, master James was marked to be silently but actually arguing with himself the same point through frequent gestures toward his body. Master Tukaram is very emotional and the reader would remember how keen he had been, he had once been at Toka in insisting upon the master to transfer his sufferings to his own little shoulders. He is also very resolute and decisive. Master Chabu Sona is no less remarkable inasmuch as he can be called without the least fear of exaggeration, the personification of humility, submission, and surrender. Masters Jamshed and Babu Sona, although keen meditators, are rather of a desperate type. Their impatience for quick results knows no limits and keeps them wavering like the waves, which never get separated from the ocean in spite of all their tossings and struggle. To sum up, all the above attributes, more or less, is to introduce Master Dalat Padir, who well represent an, represents an admixture of all the above feelings, emotions, and tendencies, emotions and tendencies in his character and conduct. There are many more who are equally warm in their feelings for the master, but I will close the chapter with a few lines about Master Pundit the eight-year-old lover of the master whose feelings have also a humor about them. Perchance the day the master would not embrace or pat him, this mischievous little pundit was sure to commit a breach of some discipline. Why? Simply because thereby he was sure to be conducted into the presence of the master for punishment and thus attract the attention of his holiness for himself. Whenever he is threatened by the master with expulsion from the Premashram or some other punishment 
for his innocent but, but mischievous conduct, Master Pundit is ready with an appeal for a last chance, which is never really meant to be the last. At such moments, he would begin crying as loudly as his little lungs would allow him and go on yelling out his pet phrases. Please give me the last, last chance. You are a diva and I am but a little boy. Oh, why do you become so harsh with me, Ari Deva? I will never do it again, and so on. The result, of course, would be a free pardon and an embrace from the master. <laughs> The strange end of a strange story. When Ali was taken away for the fourth time, one of the master's disciples rightly remarked, his father now ought to take a season ticket between Bombay and Amanadgar. <laughs> it spoke for the certainty of Ali's return. But he came back rather too soon, that is, on the 17th of January the day on which the master started on his tour. Having slipped away so many times, it was but natural on the part of Ali's relatives to arrange a plan of packing him off to Persia. But this was also, but this was also responsible for Ali to act quickly. This time Ali was kept under such a strict surveillance that he saw no hope of escape during daytime. The only chance lay in a dash for freedom at night. Being alert, Ali woke up one night through the loud. Ali woke up one night through the loud snoring of his guards, who were sleeping on either side of his bed. He steadily crept out of bed and silently unlatched the door, but found that his guards were too sharp for him. They had the door bolted from the other side too. However, a little hard thinking suggested to him a way out of his difficulty. He opened the tap of a small water tank in the bathroom, and when it became empty, he managed to shift it against the frame of the door. Then taking the stand upon that tank, he broke one of the ventilation glasses against the frame of the door, and putting out his hand through the opening, he managed to unfasten the other catch. The guards were sleeping too soundly. The guards were sleeping too soundly to hear the splinter of the glass, and thus Ali began to breathe the air of freedom once again. He was careful enough to lock his guards in the room <laughs> before he set out for the railway station and eventually found himself once again at Mirabad. Uh, thanks, Joyce. That's awesome. Um... Mayor Kiran, uh, do you, would you like to read on mute first, please? Yeah. After his return from the tour, the master began to get busy in reopening the Prem Ashram, or it may now also be called the Meher Ashram, since the original section so far seems to have been closed for good. 18 of the selected boys have been recalled. And after the celebration of his 35th birthday, which falls on the 17th of February, His Holiness is expected once again to resume exclusive workings for the institution. So much so that from the 21st of February, the master is going to cease giving an audience or an interview to visitors. And in the course of a year, he intends to establish the select boys firmly in the divine path. Although English will be taught to the boys by way of secular education, yet most of the time throughout this period is intended to be devoted to the spiritual training only. It is never easy and pleasant to write history, but to comment upon it when it is in the melting pot is not so very comfortable because invariably it is the subsequent events that prove in the long run the true significance, meaning a necessity of an action or fact of the day. And 
where it concerns the words and actions of the master that is true to the letter. However, since I have shaped the subject matter of this book in the form of a story, which from the viewpoint remains unfinished, I think I owe some explanations to the reader. It was a very trivial incident, yet today it suddenly strikes me as the most suitable simile and the handiest peg on which to hang my explanations. Many years ago, I happened to call at a friend's place. And while killing time in fishing out knickknacks there, I came across a very artistic golden picture frame. But the picture it contained appeared to me nothing short of an ink splashed page torn of a mischievous schoolboy's rough drawing book. What a pity. I could not help calling out to my friend that you have spoiled this fine frame with such a rubbish. It was in fact a masterpiece in watercolors, but I had so far seen none before. You meant to say that, the friend tried to explain, but I felt so sure of the poor show the picture gave in my hands that I did not let him finish the sentence and chipped in. I mean, what I actually see. Then you don't see at all, my friend, replied the gentleman without in the least being affected by my wholesale condemnation of his choice. Come, I will make you see it. And with that, he snatched the frame from my hands, jumped on a sideboard and fixed it at a certain height. Then holding my sleeves in an authoritative manner, he dragged me to a certain distance and simply spoke the single word, see. There was no need of an argument. All I could do was to scratch my head in silent submission to the triumph of my friend. That picture now looked very lifelike for all the red, white and black scratches on it. It was a realistic depiction of the Christmas morn. The little that it bore. But today, when I remember the fine painting in imagination, I clearly see how the very crudest bowls of red and white in it were transformed into the futures of the two musicians in the snow-clad street that the masterpiece depicted when it was placed at a right distance. Hence, if the question of a slight difference in distance and position had made me so sweepingly underrate the piece of art, I am sure that my ignorance of art would have forced me to take the artist had I seen him in the course of painting it as one being gone stark mad. Similarly, this book, whatever it may be called, is really a sidelight on the master's eventful career. And as such, in the absence of the past and certain future links, issue to appear an incomplete picture with many inexplicable scratches and splashes on it. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, Anne Elizabeth, please, can you unmute and continue? Sure. But it is not only to give relief and expression to this meaning alone, that I have given so much prominence to this trivial but telling incident of my life. I rather mean that since the year 1922, nine years after becoming super conscious by the grace of Hazrat Babajan, the time he became a conscious Sadhguru or Kutub, that is, in simple words, quote, the completely super conscious plus completely gross conscious, end quote, personality through the grace of his second guru, Sri Sadguru Upasni Maharaj. The master is busy with a certain working, and I want to call this working as the picture in the course of these explanations. The silence, fast, confinements, the mission to the West and various other activities and movements of the master have been described in the foregoing pages as to appear the motive power that brought about the general 
subject matter of this book, the origination of Meher Ashram and the existence of Prim Ashram. And to the best of my knowledge and belief, this is nothing but the gospel truth. Although these actions and movements of the master alone created the above monumental facts and institutions, they were not solely indulged in and acted upon for these results only. They rather were and are some stray brushwork of the great divine painter in connection with the picture that he has been painting since the last seven years and which will surely be presented to the world one of these fine days. As an illustration to my contentions about the picture, I would quote a recent explanation that the master was pleased to give when asked as to the reasons of his observing a fast after attaining perfection. His holiness conveyed, quote, when I observe a fast, it amounts to all the people of the world having observed it, since it is none but I in all, end quote. This incidentally explains the reason as to why, in spite of being the Sidja, Sadja, and Maju, that is, praying prayer and prayed to all himself, the Arabian prophet still prayed five times every day. That means all the people of the age in which the prophet lived got the impressions of having prayed themselves. Similarly, when Christ condescended to be crucified, although he had powers to raise the dead, it meant the whole world being crucified in the path of truth at the cost of the few who took part in that ghastly deed. Since the few were not one with truth, the consequences of their foul deed remained restricted to themselves, while the impressions of being sacrificed in the cause of the truth were shared by the rest of the world through the omnipresent link, the Christ, whose own words, my bloods will, will wash the sins of all, corroborates this great fact. In spite of all the explanations that I have understood and the close contact for years that I have had the privilege and good fortune of enjoying of him, the master remains a mystery to me so far as his words and actions are concerned. Hence, as regards the hero, I can say no more than repeat once again that Ali will surely become as full of divine love as the real Ali of Arabia one day in the near future, though perhaps he may yet have to pass through some more purifying ordeals on one pretext or the other. But from the real point of view, it will make no difference in his heart, which is already full to the brim with spirituality and lacks but a complete manifestation pending the final touch. Thank you, Anne Elizabeth. Uh, Mahu, could you un unmute and continue? Yes. From the spiritual, from the spiritual aspect of religion, I am quiet one, quiet, quiet one with the disciple of Hazrat or Yazid Bistami, who when once questioned whether God was great on his master, replied, quote, I only know my teacher. I know, I only know my teacher. I know no other than him, and he is greater than all beside. And although I may differ considerably in the interpretation of the spirit of Islam, from the majority of the Orthodox Muslims, Muslims, yet where the te temporal side of religion 
is concerned, I still owe my allegiance to the mighty music of the heart, Muhammad. And as such, I feel I have a right to appeal to my co-religionists, including the father of the hero, to desist from playing into the hands of the devil. May saner consoles prevail. Amen. Let's see if there's an epilogue. <clears throat> I guess um, I guess this is a list of editorial alterations. Or typos, in other words. Yep, that's it. Thank you so <laughs> much, everybody. That was awesome. What was the second name of the hero, Ali? What, what, any, the, I guess middle.